Hello and welcome to the online tutorial for Thomas Hardy's The Darkling Thrush. Let's have a listen to this poem being read aloud. The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre grey and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlent, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, in a full-hearted even song of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled through his happy good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware. The single most important thing about this poem is that it's written at the end of the 18th century. Now, some people will argue that that means that this poem is about Hardy's own feelings of concern about the future, and that's certainly something that we've seen in the other poems that we've studied thus far. However, there are moments within this poem that suggest there's something far more profound about Hardy's despair here, rather than just about his hopes for the future. We may want to consider that quite a lot of this poem is actually about a despair with his own creativity. Now let's have a look at this first stanza. So when we look at this we can see that it's an octet, so that's a stanza with eight lines and we can see that there's a balladic form taking place here so that each line is written in iambic tetrameter and there's alternate rhyme taking place. What you need to remember is that if you just note that in your exam you're not going to get a very good mark. What you need to do is explain why has Hardy chosen this particular form. So this notion that he's telling a story, that there's something quite pleasant about this, this tone of writing. If we look first at that opening line, I leant upon a coppice gate. Now, that could be taken literally, so Thomas Hardy is stood at the end of his garden at the gate that leads down to the, the wood at the end. Or we may like to interpret that as being something that is more metaphorical, that the coppice, the wood, represents something dark, represents something unpleasant, and that actually by being stood at the gate for the coppice, Hardy is preparing to take that journey into the dark. Certainly when we look at the rest of the poem, that sort of interpretation does seem to take place. As we walk through the poem, we can see that there are lots of quite negative semantic fields being established. We have spectre grey, dregs, desolate, weakening, tangled, broken, haunted. All of this language is establishing a very negative atmosphere for the poem. Winter is very symbolic here. The pathetic fallacy of death, the pathetic fallacy of ends. Very, very negative, very powerfully expressed by Hardy right at the opening. And we can argue that the weakening eye of a day is very much his own feelings about the future, his own feelings about the new century that is coming. However, for me, one of the most significant moments here is the string of broken lyres because we can see that broken liar as being metaphorical in some way for his own feelings of creativity, for his own belief in his ability as a writer. And as Hardy stands at the coppice gate looking forward to the future, we may feel that he's seeing a very negative future for himself as a writer. 
Towards the very end of this stanza, we see that all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires, establishing hardiers, being somehow outside of everything else, alienated, left in some manner not part of a world that has gone for its household fires. Now, the second stanza pretty much develops the atmosphere established in the first. We see many more of these death semantics, the century's corpse, the crypts, the death laments, the shrunken hard and dry. Lots and lots of language of death and the end of renewal, which is probably the most important thing to pick out here, is this is a winter that doesn't seem to preclude a, a spring. There doesn't appear to be any expectation that the ancient pulse of German birth is, is, is going to come back to life. So if we look at that moment there as a sort of symbol of renewal or a, a symbol of restarting this, this century, Hardy doesn't seem to be noting that that's something that's going to take place, that the century's corpse outlent, the his crypt, the cloudy canopy, these incredibly final, ultimate language here that doesn't seem to recognise there's any possibility of, of the future. And right at the end of this stanza where Hardy notices that his spirit is, is featherless, that he has no energy, he has no fight for the future. And very much this second stanza therefore has finally established this, this incredibly negative mood for the poem. And then, amongst all this negativity, in the third stanza we get this burst of joy entering the poem. And Hardy's whole atmosphere and tone and feelings of depression and negativity and pessimism seem to be overcome momentarily by the voice of the thrush. And it's really important to notice that the voice in that first line breaks through the bleak twigs as if this whole carapace of, of, of negativity is burst by the presence of the thrush and it's full-hearted evensong of joy that just pierces the gloom is absolutely crucial and what is more so the fact that Hardy notices that the thrush is aged, frail, gaunt, small, in blasped, beruffled plume that there is nothing special or ethereal about this thrush. It is aged, it is like him, it is worn out by the existence of life, and yet this thrush is still able to fling his soul into the gloom. That this thrush is in some way able to cope with the negativity that has left Hardy himself featherless. And this third stanza absolutely encaptures this feeling of hope that we may feel appears in, in, in many of Hardy's poems, but that it is frail and small and easily broken, and yet for all that it chooses to fling its soul. And then we move into the final stanza, and this is a stanza there's been a huge amount of debate over, because we need to question whether the existence of the thrush and the action of the thrush singing his happy goodnight air has reinvigorated Hardy, has changed Hardy's view of things, or whether that final line, that I was unaware, absolutely proves that the existence of the thrush has not changed Hardy's point of view. So this thrush in itself is either something that has inspired and reinvigorated and removed this semantic field of death that overhangs the rest of the poem, or it is something that is a momentary evensong, a momentary joy that Hardy acknowledges and notices and then says he's unaware of why it feels happy. And your reading of that final stanza will greatly affect how you write about this poem. People are unsure, therefore do not feel worried about taking one reading or the other. The most significant way you can deal with it is to highlight the fact there is that debate. But crucially, as we end this poem, you must recognise that the thrush itself represents hope. It represents 
the opportunity for the future to restart and how Hardy responds to that is the key to this poem. So I hope that's been a useful revision exercise. I'll leave you with a partly completed strive grid that hopefully matches your own notes and while you look at that I will play you the Darkling Thrush being sung by the Texas All-State Choir. <laughs>